Good morning, everyone. So, last time uh, we looked at how Stalin came into power by associating himself with Lenin and by organizing his funeral. However, did this not automatically make him the absolute leader of the Soviet Union? There were other people who were also vying for power, like his arch nemesis Leon Trotsky. So, how did Stalin achieve and maintain his unquestioned absolute supremacy over the Soviet Union for almost 30 years, despite his tragical inability to ensure the prosperity of his country? The answer is in the title of this lesson, with fear and terror. Now, today we're going to look at the instruments of Stalin's rule. So, the purges, the secret police, the gulags, the massacres, and the cult of personality. And we're going to try to answer the question, how did Stalin keep himself in power before World War II? As we're, and as we're going to, say, to see in the next lesson, World War II changed a lot of things in the Soviet Union and contributed to strengthen Stalin's power. So, the purges, the most uh, famous element of Stalin's regime, so much that the word purge itself is generally automatically associated with the word Stalin, Stalin's purges, at least in my mind. Initially, uh, they were targeted, uh, the, the purges were targeted accusations of non-socialists or anti-Soviet -so behavior directed towards his political rivals in the Communist Party of the USSR. So, what does it mean? If you were saying something that might have possibly maybe sounded non-communist, non-Soviet, you got purged. So, people like Kamenev, one of the most important leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution, were accused of being reactionaries, that is, agents of the bourgeoisie, the evil capitalist, and of plotting to sell the Soviet Union to the capitalist enemies. They were forced to confess and duly killed. Others, like, like Trotsky, who had been a very successful commander during the Russian Civil War, and was also Stalin's most important rival, uh, were also people like Trotsky, sorry, were also sentenced to death, but managed to flee abroad. Trotsky himself fled initially to America and then to Mexico, where, is, where he met his, and his death at the end of Ramon Mercadero. Ramon Mercadero, a Spanish agent of the Soviets who killed him by repeatedly hitting him in the head with an ice pick. You can see here the actual ice pick used by Ramon Mercader, and here the actual Trotsky moment before his early demise. But um, the purges did not only target polit political rivals, they also targeted those segments of the population of the Soviet Union which did not fit in the commun communist ideology. For example, the Orthodox clergy, one, uh, maybe you don't know this, but one of the main uh, things, uh, one of the main tenets of communism was state-sponsored atheism, in a way, the belief that religion was a negative force for society, uh, an instrument of bourgeois oppression, of capitalist oppression, and therefore it needed to be, you get it, purged. So the Orthodox clergy, since Russia was, uh, for the majority, Orthodox, was almost completely annihilated. 85% of the clergy and the monks were either imprisoned or killed, and something very similar happened to the Muslims who lived in the Central Asian provinces of the Soviet Union, what is now the mosaic of the Stan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and so on. Finally, uh, experienced army officers were also victims of the purges in the late 1930s. Why purging officers? Why uh, purging experienced and competent army officers? So, those who looked maybe too promising, or who were considered to be supporters of Trotsky, or maybe had simply clashed with Stalin in the past. They were all put under trial in secret, accused of being enemy agents, because they, need, they still needed to, to have criminal charges against them, and executed or imprisoned. This was probably the most disastrous of all the purges for the Soviet Union. By getting rid of the most experienced and competent officers in the Red Army, Stalin had made sure that Hitler's invasion in 1942 was met with an extremely ineffective resistance, at least initially. The main weapon of Stalin against his political and ideological rivals, that is, those who dared think differently from him in any way, was the NKVD. 
As an institution, it was initially established as a normal police force, but it was soon turned into a secret police by Stalin in the early 1930s. The main role of the NKVD was to make sure that nobody could come even remotely close to threatening Stalin's position. They arrested people for expressing beliefs that were contrary to the Soviet doctrines at the time, or simply because they could pose a threat to Stalin's absolute rule. During the Great Terror, they had a minimum number of arrests each month. And as you can imagine, this worked as a spur to arrest and execute as many people as possible, even if there was no reason for it. Important victims were generally allowed to go through fake trials, either in secret, if they had public support, or in public to show everyone their fake forced confession. Look at this former glorious general of the Red Army that we have captured. <clears throat> he has just confessed to be in the paybook of the capitalist conspiracy, while in reality he was just someone that Stalin didn't like, for example. Other, less important prisoners were often just killed without a trial, shot in the back of the head and left for dead. The NKVD was a constant shadow in the life of the Soviet citizens during, uh, during Stalin's rule, from Stalin's rise to power in 1924 to the de-Stalinization of the 1950s, we will get there eventually. They had the ability to implicate and condemn entire families for the ideological crime of a single member, so if uh, for whatever reason uh, the member of a family was accused, the entire family was implicated as accomplices. And it is not uncommon to read in the, in the sources from the time, fathers accusing children or children accusing fathers in order to distance themselves from them for fear of being caught by the, by the secret police. Sometimes uh, children would be so ideologically brainwashed or so afraid that they would give away their parents to the secret police because they had said or done something that was deemed to be anti-Soviet. During Stalin's rule, the NKVD put into place a network of constant ideological surveillance, which was, together with Nazi Germany, and possibly even more than Nazi Germany, the inspiration for Orwell's novel 1984. The NKVD also had the power of sending people to the gulags. In Russian, gulag was the acronym for a Soviet government agency that oversaw war camps, but in English and in most other languages, it had become the synonym with forced labor camps and with the system of oppression, re-education and extermination of the Soviet political prisoners. Gulags were essentially forced labor camps where dissidents were sent in order to be re-educated into respecting the Stalinist orthodoxy by being forced to work until exhaustion killed them. To make things worse, the gulags were located in Siberia, which is one of the most inhospitable areas of the Soviet Union with winters going down to minus 40 degrees at time. This was already a tradition under the Tsars. For example, important writers like Dostoevsky were sent to, to Siberia in exile in the late 1800s for political reasons. But it reached an absolutely grotesque magnitude during Stalin's rule. It is estimated that about 18 million people were sent to the gulags between 1924 and 1953. A few returned but many died there. To put things in perspective is the entire population of Romania. It's a huge number. Another technique used by the NKVD was mass operation. For example, they could target ethnic minorities. The Soviet Union was an incredibly diverse country with hundreds of ethnicities, Russian being only one of them. The Stalinist government believed that some, some of those ethnic groups the Poles, the Latvians, the Germans, and even the Greeks. Why were the Greeks in the Soviet Union? That's an interesting story for another time. So they believed that all these foreign groups could be used as spies by foreign governments. Poland and the Soviet Union had been at war in the 1920s. Therefore, the Polish population was arrested and many of them were massacred. Hundreds of thousands of people belonging to these groups were the target of mass expulsions, persecutions and massacres. For example, as we said, about 20% of the Polish minority, we're talking 120,000 people in the Soviet Union, was exterminated by the NKVD before the war. And even after we got the, the cutting massacres after the war, the, the, there's never been uh, much uh, goodwill going on between the Soviet Union and Poland in general. 
Other groups, uh, like those who survived the pogroms against the Kulaks in the, in the early 1930s, remember we talked about it in the last lesson, were identified as potential enemies of the proletariats and either massacred or sent to the Gulags. And finally, another way Stalin had been able to consolidate his control over the entirety of the Soviet Union was by creating a cult of personality around him. He posed as the father of the country, as you can see in this picture of him holding this blonde baby. And the Soviet press kept referring to him with adjectives like the great, the beloved, the genius, the wise, and so on and so on. His face was everywhere, was absolutely everywhere. His portraits replaced orthodox icons in many houses. He was worshipped like a saint. Indeed, it is possible to say that Stalin's cult of personality had many elements in common with the sacred monarchy of Imperial Russia, where the Tsars was seen as an emissary of God on earth in the Russian and Byzantine tradition. As we have said in the last lesson, you can kill an emperor, but you cannot kill an empire. Many aspects of life in Tsarist Russia persisted with only superficial changes during the Soviet era, and one of them was the absolute adoration and worshipping of the great leader. Despite feeling absurd and dangerous to us, the cult of personality created by Stalin around his own image was one of the things that allowed the Soviet Union to survive the ordeal of Operation Barbarossa in 1942, the Nazi invasion of Russia. Without a strong leadership, universally accepted and respected to the point of being actively worshipped, the Soviet Union would have had a much harder time resisting the unstoppable assault of Nazi Germany, especially after Stalin himself had decapitated most of the officers in the army. So, those were the very essential facts of Stalin and his purges. The reality is much more disturbing and much more complicated. I kept away some of the most disturbing and creepy details. But if you're interested, the internet is a strange place, you can find everything. So, try to answer this question, how did Stalin hold on to power before World War II? And I'm looking forward to read what you can write. See you next time.